evening, Dr. J.L. Torres. Dr. Torres is the author of a novel called The Accidental Native, The Family Terrorist and Other Stories, and the collection of poetry called Boricua Passport. His most recent short story collection, Migrations, won the inaugural Tomas Rivera Book Prize. Of Migrations, Judge Luis Alberto Urrea wrote, Migrations showcases a major talent. It resonates with the music of hard luck classics from our past, yet sings songs of evasive redemption. He has published short stories and poems in numerous journals and magazines, including the North American Review, Denver Quarterly, Hayden's Ferry Review, Echoberg Review, Preto de Del Sol, Las Americas Review, and the groundbreaking anthology, Growing Up Latino. A professor emeritus at SUNY Plattsburgh and a Fulbright recipient, he has taught American literature, United States ethnic literatures, and creative writing. He has published various essays on Latinx literature and multi-ethnic literature, and co-edited Writing Off the Hyphen, New Critical Perspectives on the Literature of Puerto Rican Diaspora. Besides the PhD, he holds an MFA in creative writing from Columbia University, and he co-founded the Saranac Review and served as editor for many years. Another fun fact about Dr. Torres is that he, being a retired professor from SUNY Plattsburgh, he was my professor when I was an undergraduate there 15 years ago. And I took multi-ethnic literature course with him and also um, writing flash fiction course with him. And what a true honor it is to welcome him to SUNY Oneonta as a professor, um, as he is a professor of my heart forever and always, having had such a lasting forever impact on me, which speaks to the power of education, the power of connection, and the power also of writing. Without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Torres, who is going to um, give us a treat and read from his book, Migrations. Thank you so much, Dr. Mason. Um, this is the reason why we teach. This is an amazing experience to have someone who you taught and back then saw so much talent and she's come such a long way, so it's fabulous. This is why we do what we do. Right, so um, I wanted it first because, uh, and I want to thank everybody, by the way, that was involved in, in this, uh, including the, uh, the students from uh, the Africana and Latinx uh, Studies Club. Anybody from here, from there? Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> no, but it's weird. I wanted to thank them personally, but okay, hang on. Uh, so I wanted to read, because uh, it is the, uh, the 30th uh, you know, anniversary, anniversary of the Blacklist, I wanted to read something from my novella that deals with Roberto Clemente. And, but you know, for some reason, the Wi-Fi couldn't get it on my Kindle. But lo and behold, I remembered, Sheena, that I actually have part of it here. Um, Clemente Burning is uh, sort of the beginning of that novella that I started, one of the early draft. So I am going to read from that because it does deal with issues of racism and I think it's fitting for, uh, you know, um, the day that you know, we're celebrating, what we're celebrating. Or, actually, we're not celebrating, we're commemorating, which is very different. So yeah, this is, um, this is uh, one of the stories in the collection and is uh, titled Clemente Burning. Um, and it deals, uh, just a little bit, because I'm going to start sort of maybe a little bit in the middle. Um, it, it, the novella really deals with racism from the perspective of an Afro-Puerto Rican, which I think is very different uh, than kind of the racism that we have here. I'm not saying it's better, it's just saying that because of the fact that um, Latin Americans and Caribbean people like, like myself are a mix, we are. Um, the issue of you know, working around the black and white paradigm is a little bit difficult and different for us. And imagine a person like Clemente, who's an Afro-Puerto Rican, going to the States and having to deal with that firsthand, like he did. And I don't know, how many of you know who Roberto Clemente is? Okay, see, I understand, well, you must be a big baseball fan, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, Roberto Clemente was, was a Hall of Fame uh, baseball player, uh, one of the great ones. Um, he, uh, besides that, was a great humanitarian who actually died 
in a mission to Nicaragua, uh, helping the uh, victims of the Managua, Managua earthquake back in 1972. We'll be sort of commemorating the 50th anniversary of his death, actually, in December, uh, the New Year's New Year's Eve. That's when he he, uh, he died in a tragic um, car, a car <laughs> plane crash, and uh, going over there. So um, the novella takes place with him in the afterlife. So he's died, and now he goes to this afterworld that where memories are very important. Memories are sort of the uh, substance of the, the existence of the people who inhabit this afterlife. And so memories, through memories, you can share sort of other people's lives because you're sharing their memories and your moments in their past life. And also that it's a sort of a portal to other worlds. Right? That's very important to remember as I read this. So as he is, is in this afterlife, he's going through all these memories that he deals with because the point of going to this afterlife that's sort of a way station uh, is that whatever issues you have that are still haunting you, you have to resolve somehow. And you have to go through this journey. And in the journey, he's meeting all these uh, important uh, Afro Puerto Ricans that are going to mentor him and guide him towards trying to answer those questions. And a lot of the questions have to do with racism because that is some very perplexing for him in his real life. So uh, this is interesting and very early. I forgot that I had a collection that really would be eventually the novella in here. And um, so he's now met Arturo Schomburg, another illustrious Afro-Puerto Rican who, if you know the Schomburg Library in New York, it's named after him. And every time they're asked Puerto Ricans, you know who Arturo Schomburg is? They say, no. He says, you should. It's embarrassing you don't know who Arturo Schomburg is as a you know, fellow Puerto Rican. He um, started really sort of archiving um, Africana uh, materials, books, and everything that had to do with, um, you know, African studies. And eventually that would become the Schomburg Library. He had a great impact on the Harlem Renaissance. I don't know a lot of people. I got the feeling that everybody was going to Arturo's house to, can I read that book that you have there? Um, and that was sort of the beginnings of, of in many ways, the, a lot of information that they were getting from this man and he also became friends of a lot of the uh, you know, poets and writers in the Hall of Renaissance. So he has met him and Arturo basically tells him, you know, in my life I was once told that, you know, African people did nothing, they contributed nothing, and that's what compelled me to find, you know, to, to prove that person wrong, and he did. And so every Puerto Rican should go through that journey and find that, and he says, you are, you, it's time for you to do that, that's what you're going to be doing in this, in this world. So after he tells him that, he says, what is this guy talking about now? So then he starts getting these memories, these little flashbacks, and I'm going to start with uh, the beginning of that, okay? He conjures two faces, his father's downcast eyes, tight lips, rigid jaw. Across from him, Don Pepito, the big belly boss of the Victoria Sugar Company, his face blotched, a grin that belies his anger and frustration, the day he heard, uh, the day he heard him chew out his father. Clemente, Clemente, he abellowed. The years are low. Before his father could respond, the fat mayor with a waxed mustache went into a tirade about how everyone's job is on the line. Get me some strong arms out here. Why aren't you getting more molletos? And molletos is sort of a derogatory term in Puerto Rico for, for you know, black people. Um, he asked. His father didn't answer, which just angered the boss even more. Go on your own, Brit. That's the reason why I made you foreman, so you can recruit more of your people. You got the back for this type of work, and you don't get sunburned so easy. That's the great contribution of Negros to our country. He said this with gravitas and propriety as he wiped his face with a handkerchief. I want more molletos out here. They're cutting the cane. We need to increase production. Clemente was stacking cane far enough from the uh, swinging machetes that he saw and heard the two men. He didn't like Don Pepito talking to his father that way. Why doesn't he talk back or tell him to lower his voice? The men his father supervised were working but they were also listening to the exchange. When they rode back home in the company truck, he asked his father why he, why he didn't hire more mojetos. Tense, Melchor Clemente told his son, don't use that word, moment. Moment was a nickname for, for Clemente. It's not a good word. After a few minutes with a smile, his father added, Don Pepito must see thousands of negritos in his dreams or under his bed. There aren't enough to work. He understood what his father meant. In school, other children looked indio, trigueño, but no one could deny his ebony complexion. Once Miguel Santos screamed that he had bimba lips. He wanted to punch his mouth and turn his lips into bembas. 
but his parents would have been upset with him. They preached against fighting and getting into trouble in school. We work hard, his mother used to say. We don't need problems from your teachers. And Homie stared at the mirror to check his lips and came to the conclusion that they weren't that big after all. He had bello grifo, nappy hair, but at least everyone said he's an elito perfilao. Perfilao is another racist term in Puerto Rico that, uh, you know, you have features that are more European sort of meaning, okay? Uh, a black boy with nicely shaped nose and lips. Is negrito a good word? Of course. I call you negrito all the time, right? And you call mommy negrita. That's right. Uh, they pass acres of rolling cane as they bounce down the dusty road back home. Clemente's young muscles ache from lifting cane and bundles from their modest home house. Mature turn up to his son. You know, Mormon, it's hard to say, but sometimes black people are just not dependable. Don Pepito thinks he knows black people. Why don't you explain that to Don Pepito? He laughed and shook his head. You want me to lose my job? And of course, it, you know, it's almost like the, he keeps transporting from memory to memory uh, uh, as, as he continues his journey, right? So all of a sudden, uh, everything washes out in a flash blinding light and Clemente is, is standing in a hallway of his elementary school the day the girl giggled when he gave her a caramel. Then when, when she thought he wasn't looking, threw, in, threw it in the garbage with a twisted face shaking her hand like it had germs. The light's energy propelled him to a corner of his high school where Amalia, the pretty brown girl with big hazel eyes who smelled like gardenias, told him she couldn't date him anymore because he was too dark. At a park, his friend Tomas stopped playing with him and later wouldn't look at him, so he walked his, as he walked with his father, his not spared, flared as he's smelling something bad every time he saw Clemente. The powerful light surges and flushes through him, images cascading past, the fear and subdued disgust on the priest's face as he offered him the host during mass. The surpri surprised looks of light-skinned classmates when he contributed something in class, glances never reserved for the light-skinned team captain. He became overwhelmed with the idea that his truest white friends, if they ever transcended their sense of superiority over him, always pitied him for being darker. He had buried those moments, those ideas, somewhere cavernous and arcane. The power of his confidence had kept him there. His entire childhood is opening, right for review. Perhaps here were the reasons why he gravi gravitated to baseball, for why he stayed in his room tossing a scruffy baseball against the wall until nightfall, why he spent hours hitting bottle caps with a thin broom broomstick, hiding in an imaginary world of baseball where crowds chanted his name, a place that blocked everything bad and ugly, a place far from buried me memories that hurt. The spring, Clemente headed to Montreal to begin his professional baseball career. His family gathered to bid him farewell. His mother cried and kissed him. His siblings hugged him and teary-eyed. For such a close family to have one of their own lead to such a far foreign place was sad, bordering and tragic. Clemente was about to get into his brother's Martino's car to depart for the airport when his father appeared with a fawn-colored fedora. He offered it as a going-away gift. This will keep your head warm up there, he said. Clemente thanked his father and his insistence insist put it on and then got into the car. He took off and sat on his lap right after his brother sped off. Does he really expect me to wear this? He asked his brother, raising the fedora from his lap. Come on, woman. He gave it to you with love, Martino teased him. It's an old person's hat. Not true. Poppy says all the men up north are wearing them. All white men, you mean. His brother said nothing and noticed Clemente's mocking smile turned into a smirk. They rode in silence. After the car reached the highway to the airport miles from home, Clemente lowered the window and flung the hat toward the passing grasslands. He sat quiet the rest of the ride. The Pirates were aboard a train bound for St. Louis to play a three-game set after dropping a game to the Cubs. They were in the middle of a brutal 12-game road trip, which was going well, wasn't going well and would end worse. It was mid-May in Clemente's debut season, and they were struggling at the bottom of the league now chugging along a train, on a train, traveling through America's heartland. Halfway into the trip, some teammates napped. A few played cars or read newspapers. Others escaped to the lounge car for drinks. Clemente couldn't sleep. He had never traveled to this part of the United States and absorbed the passing view out of the window. Distant farmhouses bigger than those in, on the island. The occasional tractor rumbling along, trucks toppling with rolls of hay, the stink of pig and chicken shit in the air, acres of wheat fields blanketing the landscape for miles. They reminded him of the cane fields back home. 
An erratic drumming broke the daydream. He turned around to the back and prez, the backup fresh, uh, first baseman was striking a bongo with sausage fingers. No rhythm whatsoever, Clemente thought. The playing was bad enough, but he began wailing, grunting, and making monkey noises. The Pirates only had one African-American player, Kurt Roberts. He slouched in his seat, disturbed and slumbered by Paris's antics. He looked back once and turned around to gaze out the window with a quick sneer. The three black Latino players, Clemente and the Cubans Lino Donoso and Roman Mejias, shared bothered looks but ignored him. The other Latino on the team, Felipe Montemayor, shook his head and smiled, amused. Felipe was a light-skinned Puerto Rican, uh, <laughs> Mexican. Uh, Prez bought the, the bongos in Havana on one of his trips to Cuba for a taste of the nightlife. Damn, I love Cuba, he had said several times. Love me the cigars, the rum, the weather, especially the senoritas, he said with a raspy growl, rapping on the drums. Today he was in rare form, banging with a passion never before seen, inspired by to show off his repertoire of grunts before he let loose with a string of pseudo-Spanish verses. Lino Donoso had had enough. He was sitting across from Clemente by the aisle next to the manager, Fred Haney, who had the window seat. He remained quiet to press his anti anti antics, but mocking his native language put him over the edge. Clemente heard him whisper, hijo de puta, as he was about to stand up. Haney gripped a grip the shoulder. He stared at the picture, eyes flaring, his thin lips tighter than usual. Sit, he ordered. The manager straightened his short body and turned around toward the deck, toward the back. Press kept staring at his teammates, eyes closed now, slapping the bongos when he peered. Hey, Press, could you put the drum away? You're giving me a headache. Come on, Fred, just have a little fun. Press taps the, the bongos, grinning. Uh, Haney swaggered to the back, the train speeding through tunnel. He stopped two rows short and leaned in. Put those fucking bongos away, or I will shove them so far up your ass, they'll be calling you bug eyes for the rest of your miserable career. Then I'll find you a hundred. The lanky first baseman slipped the bongos in their seat and crossed his arms. Haney popped back into his seat, huffing, red face. Baseball wasn't so much fun anymore. He understood that colors had to break in. It was the right thing to do, but he hated all this other shit that had brought, that it had brought. Then also turned to his manager and whispered, thank you. Haney nodded and closed his heavy eyelids to sleep. At Union Station in St. Louis, the traveling secretary, Bob Bryce, gave each of the Latino players and Kurt Roberts their spending money in, in an envelope. Your hotel reservations are at the Midtown Hotel. Then also I mean, he has exchanged looks. The white players were boarding cabs to, the, to head to their hotel. Why don't we go with them, I mean, he has asked. The hotel the staying at doesn't allow colors. Rice explained, sorry fellas, not much we can do. Clemente couldn't speak English well, but having it taught in Puerto Rican schools under American law, he knew enough to translate. Que mierda, Mejia said. Then in the best English he could muster, Montemayor can go? Rice turned around and saw the Mexican outfielder walking with the others. He's white, Rice responded, confused. He's Latin American, like us, Mejia said. Roberts laughed. Rice threw up his hands, turned around, and walked away his head down. Welcome to America, Robert said, walking toward a cab. Come on, amigos, we can share the ride. The hotel's not far from here. Clemente stared, mouth open, watching the last cab full of white teammates drive away. No one in Puerto Rico had ever refused him entrance to any place. His family was poor and couldn't afford to stay at a fancy hotel. But someday, he would walk into the Carib Hilton, Normandy, or Condal Beach Hotel without a problem. He told this to the others sitting in the cab, and Don also laughed. In Cuba, even Batista couldn't get into the Billboard Yacht Club, referring to the country's dictator. They told him he was too black, and he was a mulatto. Mejias didn't laugh. I thought here it would be different, he said. Mejias didn't come from Havana, like Don also, who understood Cuban racism firsthand, having been born and raised in the capital. He experienced racism there from the white elites who were decidedly better off than the black population. Like Mejia's, this was his first year in the States, and for some reason, he also believed it would be better. Robert sat in the front seat of the car, listening to his teammates talk heatedly in Spanish and shook his head. He didn't understand what they were saying, but knew, that, knew what they were, they were, but knew what they were upset about. You all got to understand, you're in America now. White men don't give a rat's ass if you speak another language. You black, you black. Negro, he says, pronouncing in Spanish as he rubbed the side of his cheek with his two fingers. 
Don't know Sanar, he's right, he said, after Clemente gave him a quick translation. Best to lay low, Robert's added. Just deal with the shit, is all I'm saying. That's what Jackie told me, and I'm sticking to it. Everyone in the cab, even the cab driver, was black. But to Clemente, they were culturally different. A part of him felt insulted by Robert's comments. It was as if the African-American totally dismissed that the other three were from Caribbean countries, that their first language is Spanish, and the history and experience as black men was different. I'm not black like you, Clemente said. Robert smirked and laughed. The cab driver looked at the rear mirror, re, re, <laughs> rear view mirror and snickered. Okay, rookie, Robert said. Tell that to the white man. They drove to the few blocks to the Mill Creek Valley, Valley neighborhood where the hotel was located. The row houses would run down and everyone was black. Their hotel wasn't elegant. It was old and in another lifetime it probably had been something else. At least you were not going to get the evil eye, Donasa said, to which Mejias responded, Amen. They checked in and Robert told them he was going to take a nap. I'll meet you all down, downstairs in the Peacock Alley Lounge for dinner, if you're up to it. The Latinos nodded and left for the rooms. Que miendo, he has said as he grabbed his suitcase and headed for the elevator. Roberts was already downstairs having a drink and listening to the light music. He had, sh uh, he had shaved and appeared refreshed. The three Latinos greeted him and sat down to order drinks before their meal. Donoso and Mejias each had a beer. Clemente didn't drink, so he sipped water. The, quarter, the, uh, the quartet playing a, uh, featured a handsome young man singing a sad tune. He also played trumpet, melancholy, and sweet. Clemente couldn't make all the lyrics, but it wasn't necessary. Sitting there in the lounge, listening to the singer's tenor voice and his moody solos, his heartbreak was, about, was not about Allah's love, but it hurt just the same. Roberts noticed Clemente's expression. He remembered back to last year when he, was, he sat in this lounge, a rookie and all alone, the only black player in the team. Now he wondered if it was, if it was all worth it. Sad, in it, he said to Clemente. The rookie nodded and smiled. Chico, I'd rather be dancing some mambo, Donoso said, or listening to Celia and La Sonora, Mejia's added. The Latinos laughed and Clemente explained Afro-Cuban music to Roberts, how it's lively, all about dancing, having a good time. Roberts nodded and smiled, the lucky to see the blues, more to himself because he knew they would understand. After they paid for dinner and the quartet took a break, they went their separate ways. Restless, Roberts invited the others out for some lively music. The Latino players decided to play a few hands of Bisca in Donoso's room. They didn't know the city or area, which inhibited venturing out. That in their limited English. Roberts tur turned to Clemente, listen, I know we're different, but deep down, we're dealing with the same shit. Stick together, brother. This is a hard country for black folks, and it's got to be baptism by far for you. He patted him on the arm and left. On the train back east, Clemente couldn't sleep, although they had been traveling for hours. The setting sun's coral rays slanting across endless golden fields soon made him drowsy. It was night, when the train slowed down somewhere in southern Illinois. He peered out the window. About 200 yards away, a fire raged. He and some of his teammates gathered around one window for a better view. Standing next to Clemente, Roberts turned and bent toward him. Bet you don't see that in Puerto Rico. The cross mounted on an island of whiteness burned, the smoke fingered upward to the black sea, black sky, <laughs> black sky. Suddenly the fire's burning glow expands, totally encompassing Clemente. When it fades, he finds himself back within his familiar blank surroundings. Yes, the segregated hotel, the cross burning that night. Roberts explained its meaning, but he forgot about it next day. It's an American thing, una cosa de gringo and he had a game to play, but why repeat it? Why are these memories haunting me, he wonders. Out of the mist, Jean Merck reappears, holding two empty cups of coffee. He offers Clemente one, it smells good. Jean Merck smiles as Clemente takes it. Moment, let's talk, he says. They sit down at the table in a vibrant sky blue surrounds them. All right. Well, that's so different from my, for the novella, it's really changed a lot, but uh, sort of you get the gist of it, um, and he goes, continues all these different journeys. As the journey continues, he keeps meeting all these uh, different illustrious um, Afro-Puerto Ricans, including someone like uh, Miguel Enriquez, who was a privateer, one of the richest uh, men in Latin America, he was Puerto Rican, and he um, basically had the whole slave trade going. He was the only one 
had a life, he was a, you know, what we call mulatto back then, he was, you know, biracial. His father was a priest, and, um, and his mother was a slave. And he became this powerful entity in the, in, in the Caribbean, you know? Do you know what a privateer is? It's basically a pirate. <laughs> we call a pirate today, um, you know, with a license to steal. But, um, you know, he meets people like that. He meets, uh, you know, one of uh, the Burgos. Uh, uh, I, have, I have a particular episode, I call them episodes rather than chapters, uh, with these three particular artists from Jose Campeche, who is one of the big Rococo um, artists in the 18th century, and uh, Javier Hernandez, you know, one of the greatest composers in Latin America. Um, on and on and on. So every one of these individuals has something else to tell him. He learns different aspects of racism as he continues. That's in the novella, but this is the beginning of it. So I don't know how I'm doing for time. It's eight o'clock. I could read something else, I guess, right? Um, is that time for questions now? Oh, she's in for later. Should we do questions later? Or later? later? Um, we can wait a while. You can read four. Okay. All right. So um, from the collection. Let me take her to the water. This is the thing. My mom, when you read, it's like, oh my god. Okay, so um, I'm going to read um, a story that was inspired by someone who actually really I do like his writing. I like one of uh, Juno Diaz's writing, but um, as Sheena said, uh, Dr. Mason said, um, I I have taught um, Latin, you know American literature and also Latinx literature. Uh, for many decades, and one of the things that just bothers me so much is that there's so few positive uh, Latino, you know, men <laughs> in, the, in the literature. And, you know, as a Latino, and also a father of two sons, you know, I'm thinking, you know, if I give this literature to my, my sons to read, what kind of models are they going to have? There's very few of them. But persistent in the literature is this this depiction of this sort of super sexualized, um, machista, you know, philandra kind of man who's shifty and not to be trusted and all this other stuff. And so, you know, I kind of gravitated to say, what, what's up with Juno? Why is he, why is he old? And it, have you read Juno Diaz? No one's ever read Juno Diaz. All right, so, I mean, he's big. I mean, he's won all kinds of awards and stuff. And, um, I, I like his writing, but it, I don't like some, some of the things he writes, is, is what I'm saying. And so I said, this sucio, he calls them sucios, which uh, the word sucio in Spanish means dirty, you know. So these guys are like dirty, like, you know, sucio, but, but it's almost like he says it, he writes it like a, it's supposed to be some kind of proud thing <laughs> to be a sucio, you know. Uh, because in a machista society, guys like that, even though you can, complain of them, but you know, they're like players, right? They're players. And you know, there's a cold culture that thinks that they're, you know, you should be proud to be a man like that, you know? <laughs> this kind of thing. You know, so, so I decided, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, one of the things I like to do in my writing is take these tropes and kind of like put them on their heads, you know? And, uh, you know, as a fiction writer, I play the game that every fiction writer plays, is what if? What if this guy got transitioned? You know what I'm saying? I mean, if, if all of a sudden, by accident, because I don't, I, I'm a realist writer, that's not gonna happen if two people bump into each other and they switch bodies, you know, that's not that, or some, something happens magical, you know? The only way in the real life that's gonna happen is that is this man gets, a, a, you know, he gets, you know, surgery that he doesn't want, right? Because, I mean, this is not a transgender person. This is a, a sexual, hyper-sexualized, you know, guy that thinks he's a macho man, right? So, um, this story is about that type of person. And, of course, fittingly, the story is called Sucio, right? So, here he goes. Oh, but, you know, some of the language is a little rough because, uh, two things. Well, one thing first. Um, it's in second person. And if you read in Juno Diaz, he writes a lot in the second person. He loves it. And in many ways, he does it very well, by the way. I think he's brought that back, you know. I mean, the second person is really used in literature. So it's in the second person because a lot of this is parody and also um, satirical, all right? So understand that. And for some of you, you know, if, if you hear something really rough or whatever, 
It's not me. <laughs> it's the character or speaking with it to himself. All right? Because when you write second person, you can do it two ways. One, you can be directing it to the reader, you, the reader. Or you, the character, reflectively looking at himself. And after what this guy has gone through, it's almost like his consciousness is talking to man. How did it happen? How did this happen to you? You know, so the you is really himself talking to himself, okay? So, okay. Sucio. You were a sucio and you knew it. Your father was one. Your three brothers raised the standard. Your grandfather is in the Suciaria Hall of Fame. In fact, the entire male lineage, going back to the Stone Age, probably was a bunch of guys who couldn't keep their junk from getting them into trouble. When the stand-up cavemen were out hunting to feed the tribe, your male ancestor was banging somebody's old lady as soon as she bent to gather. When the Crusaders marched off to liberate the Holy Land, your guys stayed behind for the leftovers. You shudder to think what they may have been doing during the plague. Famine, pestilence, war, death, it didn't matter. The male bloods in your tribe rode behind, plying to women and not caring who it hurt, like it was a birthright. That's what the mantras in your family believed. They taught you to be a sucio, not to cry, especially over an old woman. Screw them and leave them, right? You didn't question, and you learned. But sooner or later, karma had to catch up to somebody somehow. Guess that be you, the only one in recent memory who had any conscience about using your penis as the frontal lobe of your brain. You had the audacity to be sweet to bitches who dumped you. That was the first sign. Sitting around listening to boleros when you were crushing on some mommy, another sign. Then you met her, the love interest, la femme fatale, the animal, sorry. She, who attended to your bruises and cracked bones from your latest beat down, this one bigger than any other whooping in the history of Sucio's getting smacked down. Another reason for your funk, the amount of violence directed at you for taking care of a slacker's business appalled you. Those mofos should be thanking you for taking care of their business. You always said if it's not being tilled, someone has to do it or it goes to weeds. And the Sucio code, that was like a commandment. But you knew the risk of suciaria, understood the consequences you were confronted, if you were confronted either by the other guy or your yeah, or worse, a femme fatale, a fatal attraction copycat. Shit will hit the fan sooner or later. And like your dishonorable ancestors, you never had a plan. It's like genetically you were programmed to be perverso but estupido. Whatever you got extra in penis size, the good lord subtracted from the dinosaur brain you inherited. Your brother Mangu called you soft all the time. Take martial arts classes, oh my lord. A man's got to learn to protect himself, he said. But you didn't listen because you thought he had nothing to teach you. Thought his mind was getting frizzed from the feminine sense he kept sniffing off his fingers. By the way, that's a direct, you know, allusion to Juno Diaz's. There's a section where he actually says something like that, so I had to use it. Anyway, um, I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, I read that, I was like, oh my God, you know. Anyway, uh, true. This, this beatdown was epic, really tragic. You had, you had bad ones before. Like that time you got caught following the drag queen, you thought it was just another girl on your jock. Bad enough your gender reader was all way off, but then her BF and crew who looked like they walked off the set of Drag Race made sure to have your ass handed to you. Or when that weekend knocked you over, knocked you out cold and tossed, tossed your sorry ass into a dumpster for hitting on his girlfriend, you could have walked away. But you started saying nasty lies about how slutty she was. You can't remember how many times you've been smacked in the face. How many drinks tossed in your face. Sometimes both at the same time. And you're getting sloppier. If that's possible, dude found you in bed with his wife. How cliche is that? You couldn't plan it better or, or listen to the, to the bitch when she told you make it fast because the old man's going to come home soon? Didn't you know where new, where new is like... The, the Puerto Rican term for a cockle, you know, right? Quernu, you know, horns, Quernu horns. Quernu, uh, didn't, you, didn't you know Quernu worked out and kept in considerably better shape than you will ever be in? Six feet, three inches, and jacked. Hands the size of two perniles, and at the moment fueled by righteous anger over his wife sleeping with someone like you. You owe your life to Miss Niz Quernu and her loud screaming the snap husband from his steroid-induced Hulk-like fury, leaving you bloodied and broken on the mat of love, like the loser at a 90s UFC match. All that didn't matter because when Sally walked into your hospital room, you thought the pain was worth it. Even with the drug-induced euphoria, you noticed that beautiful behind. Now this is another thing about Juno Diaz. I don't know how many passages in his work had to deal with the you know, female anatomy. 
You know what I mean? And he's got a definite, you know, obsession with, you know, women's behinds. So again, this is not, you know, this is just me parodying this, okay? <laughs> All that didn't matter because when Sadi walked into your hospital room, you thought the pain was worth it. Even with the drug-induced euphoria, you notice that beautiful behind. Her cheeks round and sweet, like ripe, plump, and of course, always with the allusions to, you know, fruit or some kind of food or something, right? All right. Her cheeks round and sweet like ripe, plump honeydew melons on a hot 4th of July picnic. You don't want to see something cheesy like Uranus, but it was planet of planetary proportions, maybe a dwarf form like Pluto. And even your adult brain could send enough stimuli to your huevo to make you hard. When she bent over to take your temperature, you gazed at her mocha, mocha bo, bo, <laughs> bosoms shaped like overripe papayas and suddenly got a craving for your mom's uh, dulce de lechosa. She was so jealously stuffed into her nurse uniform that your delirious but perv mind imagined your crew had hired an escort to dress as a nurse and do you a solid. But nurse, sorry, was all business. And as you healed and regained consciousness, you put on a full court press that she evaded like LeBron slipping through the Knicks defense. Homegirl did not mess. She found out the how and why behind your super smackdown. You one sorry sociopath, she said peeling off your fingers from her hand in disgust like they were slimy slugs. Then she went on to inform you what a miserable, pathetic, shallow piece of crap you are. Then, like the genuine, heartbreaking samurai she was, she dealt you the mortal blow. Your wasted life is like disgrace to dying people everywhere, she said. Nothing new, but something about she said it. With that look like she was going to puke, maybe it was the drugs or that or, or that you were spiraling down the macho chute way before you met Nerzillo. But tears flooded your eyes and you looked up at her and she laughed. Don't waste them puppy eyes on me, you slick, she said. You weren't trying to get over on her. Okay, maybe a little, but for a moment you felt a twinge of regret that your life revolved around nothing more satisfying, nothing more satisfying than, more, more, nothing more than satisfying your, the needs of your penis. For once, this realization shamed you, especially when you saw her tend to other patients with genuine tenderness. When she talked so sweetly to the abuelita in the next bed, you wanted to cry. You didn't deserve someone like her, and that unhinged you. The thought of a catastrophic fuku ruling your destiny began to haunt you. Why couldn't you be happy? Why did your penis have to dictate every aspect of your life? You wanted to turn it around. You were a modern man. Although your people came from hick towns in the mountains of DR and PR, you had transcended belief in fukus and voodoo. You grew up in the barrios of Long Island. You knew the real deal. So you sat on a mission to win Sari over, court her, dying her like a caballero with honorable intentions, old school. You wanted to crack the mental grip of all that cheating line scurrying around in the night like a rat, always playing the heavy in the drama, damaging people for nothing more than a few minutes of meaningless sex. Yeah, primate sex, mind exploding supernatural 100 OMGs, orgasmic sex, but there was always a trade-off, right? You wanted to settle down, become respectable, a family man who would teach his sons, no, his sons, the lighted path toward decency and away from suciaria. Sari had other plans. Shortly after you were released from the hospital, you returned and handed her flowers, but she gave you no time to bear your soul. She threw them back at you and they scattered all over the floor. Then she cursed you because she had to clean up the mess and told you to leave or she would call security. This is a hospital, you idiot, she screamed. I got no time for your stupid nonsense. You rode the one train back to the heights, felt flower petals decorating your jacket. At home, you slumped into a ragged sofa and watched when Harry met Sally while eating the five pounds of assorted Stover's chocolates you were going to give her. That's when it hit you, that you and your ancestors were a curse. What else could explain the painful, emotionally barren lives of you and your forebears? Every single one of them, even the halfway successful ones, waited for death hunched over a bottle of shot glass. This curse was some deep, serious stuff. You had no way out, but you could see it. You picked up your cell and made the booty call to your fav platanero, Annalise. 
She wasn't into you, but girl regularly attended the church of the one down. A short thing, a slam dunk. But sister turned you down. First time ever. That's when you knew things had hit DEFCON 1. Then you met him at the Starbucks on West 181st, the one near the church. That's where you were sitting, sipping your cafe con leche when he came out. Newspaper on his arm, holding his venti decaf, tall, sugar-free, vanilla, caramel, skinny, ice macchiato. You had seen him in his usual corner, the rider. That's what everybody in the hood called him. He was always pecking away on his laptop, deep in thought into uh, whatever book he was reading. Most times, he sat there scoping everything and everyone when he wasn't checking out the booty. His owlish eyes circling the place. Then he scratched something in, in that banged up purple spiral notebook. He looked possessed when he did that, or tapped away on his laptop. To be honest, dude didn't present much. Skinny, funky, crusted hair tied to the shortest ponytail ever. Always in black, even on the hottest summer days. Those brown golem eyes popping any time he looked up, huddled over whatever he was doing. Nobody messed with the rider. He didn't mess with anyone and seemed less harmless and bothersome than a fly. Dude looked smart and professional, so people respected him, though nobody in the hood trusted anyone who read that much. Like, all that reading was going to drive the mofo insane someday, a matter of time. The writer looked down at your sorry face and he knew. He shook his head and was going to leave, but you must have been the saddest case he ever saw of SDS, sociodepressed syndrome. He sat down across from you. Bob, you're looking too hot. You didn't want to talk to anybody, especially no ferret looking nerd. I've known dudes like you all my life, been there myself, he said. You smirked and turned toward the Chinese restaurant thinking you'd be better off eating shrimp fried rice than listening to this fool trying to front. You? <laughs> Come on, bro. What? You think a sucio has to present a certain way? I've probably landed more aviones in a week than you've seen in your entire life. It's not about looks, man. It's all about genetics. You and me both are engineered, wired to be hounds. I know. I write about it. It's no curse either. Forget the BS. But you can bring it under control. You got to or it's going to eat you alive. That woman, that woman's got you in a funk. Yeah, that one, the special one, you want to have your children? She will never ever be yours unless you do something drastic about your horny ways, brother. I'm speaking gospel truth. He got up, took his, tucked his newspaper under his armpit again. You're probably going to keep playing your stupid game, getting beat up, and dealing with all the craziness because you got no control. So what am I supposed to do, genius? He stared at you, checking to see if you were on the up and up, if you really wanted to know. He sat down again, looked around to make sure no one was listening, and whispered to you about this special clinic in the DR. He explained it was th therapy, a few drugs, some counseling, and you wouldn't be a sucio you are now. You have a normal life, like the one you want. You could approach a lady with a new attitude, because as soon as she saw you, she knew you changed. He ripped the corner off the newspaper and wrote something on it. Here, he said, handing it to you. Just ask for Victor. He'll arrange everything. It works, dude. Believe me, I know. He thought about it hard, but we're in, no, in such a bad shape, you didn't have the energy to get on a plane. You bought the writer's books, and the sucios and his stories depressed you. You had met those dudes before. They were family members, past and present. They were you. Not one was happy. And you wanted to be happy, deserved to be happy. If anything, the writer knew sucios. Days passed with you parked across the hospital trying to catch a glimpse of Sari. You sat there for hours to check if a guy picked her up and no one did. You wondered if maybe she was a little lonely too. The writer's words kept playing in your head. Therapy, a few drugs, some counseling. Months later, you just had a lot of moping and hoping, but no Sari. Nothing would have happened unless your uncle Gusto told you he was going down to the DR on one of his revolving trips down there. He asked if you wanted to hang. You knew he was using you as a cover for his wife, who for some stupid reason believed Theo wanted to show you the patria before you became too gringo -fied. She had seen you grow up and always thought you were pariguayo. She thought with you around, he wouldn't have time to get into, into, into trouble, but he was going down to see his Dominican honey. You had the blues bad, and this was your chance. You called Victor, and he gave you the rundown. Call Victor dos when you arrived at the hotel in San Domingo. 
Victor Uno said. With American cash up front, no refunds. You should have known right there, but you were too blinded by love, too, so desperate, you knew your BS de detectors shut down. Besides, this was business as usual in the DR. You withdrew the money you were saving for the 68 Cherry Red GTO, packed and waited for your uncle. Just like Victor Uno had said, as the uh, at the hotel, they picked you up in a black SUV. That's <laughs> oh my God. I got to take some water. <laughs> it's like a, no? Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Where was it? Okay. Um, you told Theo you were visiting friends for a few days. His DR babe kept him busy, so he didn't even hear what you said. Um, two guys in the car, both wearing Ray Bans, dressed in a tight and tight fitting blue Guayaveras. The one in the back, who looked like a Dominican sumo wrestler, fisted the money, counted it twice, got a blindfold, he said, nothing personal. Then the car sped off. You were on the road close to an hour. You know this because the radio DJs gave the time occasionally. It was a quiet ride, bachata and merengue streaming from the radio, and air conditioning, the only noises in the bar. They took you out, walked you into the facility, which smelled like pine soil and Dick's vapor rub. Walking through a hallway, you heard st staff talking and laughing. Otherwise, it was quiet. You wrote up an elevator. A creaky metal gate closed and opened again after a laggy ride. When they slid the blindfold off, you were sitting down and looking bleary-eyed at a gray-haired man with dark half-moons under his eyes, dressed in green scrubs. He held a cigarette between yellow fingers, the smoke curling around him. Hope you had a good trip, my friend. I'm Dr. Ben Wei. I'm handling your case. He flipped through papers in the long green folder, had you sign some forms, everything looks in order. We'll start tomorrow. Now they will show you to your room. He smiled, snapped his fingers, and an orderly came and delivered you away to a chalk white room without windows. A fan with flickering bulbs hung from the ceiling. You don't remember much after that. And if you did, you would be trying to forget. They didn't even give you a chance to understand what had happened. You were groggy when they told you, like you were high on something crazy one of your boys caught from a dark corner in the heights. You thought you saw a nurse who looked like Sadi. They talked in Spanish, which made it hard to, harder to understand. Something about equivocación, más como un desfío fatal, someone whispered, loud enough for everyone to hear, laughter. Dr. Bengue yelled at them, angry, called them all kinds of names in Spanish. Half comatose, you kept saying you didn't understand. That's what I get for working with Yotas, he said. He sat down next to you. You remember his eyes looking so sad, you thought you might be dying. Smiling, he told you everything happens for a reason. Do I have a little more time to read? Just a little more time? I mean, I, I, I can't finish the story. You'll have to buy the book to see what happens. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know if I should read the, uh, the second part because, um, yeah, just the next two paragraphs, just so that you get an idea of what, you know. Then they got you up, blindfolded you again, rolled you out in a wheelchair. They forced those painkillers down your throat, made you feel loopy. They uh, threw you back in the black SUV and dropped you at a city hospital. No one asked questions or answered yours. The first time the nurses walked you to the bathroom standing to pee, eyes closed, you searched but only grabbed air. The two nurses giggled as they sat you down. When you stood up, you caught a glimpse in the mirror and screamed. Mouth opened like you had seen a dead body. You shook and cried because it finally hit you. I'll leave it there. Okay. Ah, okay. Thank you so much. Do you have a question?